I read your bio. Oh, the one where I talk about David Hasselhoff? Or no, maybe that was my old one. No, I did not see anything about David oh, good. Hasselhoff. I, I actually, but I, I want to know what what did it say about David Hasselhoff? Oh God, I think I I left my artist bio up a little bit too long. Like it was a joke that I had, and I probably uni that I was trying to get art grants for uh, a project where I would come over to the United States to try and track down David Hasselhoff and convince him to shave off his chest hair so I could stuff a pillow with it and the pillow would then become the work of art I guess I actually did try and get funding for this project but I was turned down several times and I still think it's like a great project like I still want to see it happen but I feel like I've talked so much about it now that the idea of it might be stronger than the actual work I think you should go to the awesome foundation they will give you a thousand dollars towards that project you think so I mean, I did meet David Hasselhoff once and I pitched it to him, but he was kind of drunk at the time. It didn't seem like it would be an impossible request, but I think I would need some financial backing because it is his trademark. You could also just get a sponsor, I'm sure, to to do it. I mean, you know, get some, uh, make it a thing, like get some alcohol to sponsor it. He gets drunk, Uh shaves it off, make it a YouTube video. Put it all together. You got a whole. You could do Red Bull even. Come on, that's, you got sponsors there. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's true. I mean, I I spent. Uh, I almost got thrown out my first year of art school because I only made work about David Hasselhoff, and I made this life size painting of his chest, like covered in pubic hair. Not mine, but like every guy in the art school had to shave off their pubic hair and paste it onto this painting which unfortunately my mom has to take care of now and it's not it's not a happy thing right now she always calls me she's like you want to pick this thing up in Sweden I'm like no, no how large scale is this life it's size larger life than size life chest size. yeah it's just his chest yeah yeah all right so I mean I mean uh, if someone's out there listening to this they want to give me some money to uh pursue this art project with David Hasselhoff it's not uh, something that I've completely shelved I'd be very open to it to start again and document the process or if David Hasselhoff is listening yes please, please contact her please I mean don't make it too easy for me because you know the process is also part of the work but how amazing would it be if David Hasselhoff is actually listening to this and it would be contact you? yes <laughs> yeah it would be astounding absolutely all right <laughs> I'm glad I moved away from that part of my bio. I'm glad I that's not uh, part of it anymore. So I'm glad you read the more adult version of it. You do know I just recorded all of that, though. I know, I know. But okay. I also want to put it out in the universe in case he's around. I mean, I'm saying I haven't outgrown it quite yet. I love it. It's great. It sounds like a fun project. Thanks. Okay. So I actually, let's get back a minute. One thing that I actually wanted to know about you is your name. What do I call you? What is your oh, proper name? Yeah, you know what? That's that's a good one. So, <laughs> Well, because I, I saw Julia Ash, and then I also saw Julia S.H. Yeah, yeah, that's just, that's that's more like it. I have two last names, which made it very complicated when I moved out here. Nobody could ever spell it. They all got it wrong. Everyone thought I was Jewish. Nothing wrong with that, but it was so much to explain. So when I was a kid in Sweden, because I also have the most common Swedish name ever, there were so many Julias in my class. So they just had to say like, Julia K, Julia H. And I just was Julia S H. So I was like, well, screw it. I'll just use my little, you know, nickname from when I was a kid, which not saying that's good or bad, but unfortunately I made some work that, got some recognition while I was using that name and now I can't just part from it. I mean, and also I thought it was kind of nice to separate that from my, my amateur sumo career I once had under one of my last names, Hanson, Julia Hanson. So wait, wait, I'm sorry. Did you say yes. amateur sumo? Yes, like I won wrestling? The U- yeah. I won the U S open in sumo a couple of years ago before I, tore my ACL so that was a big thing and it just became so I've done so many weird things under my other names that I was like okay you know what I'm just gonna keep that compartmentalized it's too many questions so so that just became my art name really Julia SH but yeah 
I, oh. I'm not here to judge. I'm just asking. Oh, how to, yeah, to say no. It, yeah. I mean, if I started over, I would use my full name, but you know, done is done. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Now, would you define yourself as more of a commercial photographer or an art, fine art photographer? Oh, that's a good question. I'm always hoping that there's some interest within the commercial world to embrace more of the fine art expression. So, but for myself, I also feel like a lot of stuff I do is quite commercial and don't really fit in within the fine art kind of Well, it's a difficult world. thing. Like, I mean, yeah. I, I've been in the photo industry for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And there's always that sort of old standard of like commercial photographers can't or won't do fine art or fine mm -hmm. art photographers can't or won't do commercial work. Yeah, And it, I would imagine things are changing. And so the, so I'm sort of asking like, is it easy slash uh, different to be a uh, both commercial and fine art photographer sort of simultaneously? Do they overlap or like, do you have to do them differently? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, saying like, Oh, I only do this one thing. is a very privileged thing. I mean, maybe photographers really could make a living doing what they do, you know, 10, 20 years ago, but you know, I still have to pay my bills. I have to, you know, wear many hats. So I'm not going to say like, well, I refuse to shoot this thing because I still enjoy photography. So if I could have it my way, so to speak, then if somebody just wanted to pay me a shit ton of money just to make art prints all day long, I mean, sure I would. But finding also that there are certain commercial photography opportunities where they still want to incorporate the kind of fine art language, to me, it's a very exciting so I'm not going to rule that out, but I don't really label myself, so, you know, like a fine art photographer or, or commercial. I feel like I am pretty fluid between the two, but I think I gravitate to more toward the fine art. And, and, and if that was a thing I could do full time, then awesome. But it is not at this point. Yeah. It's never you that can define what you are. It's the other people that will sure. define you, whether you like it or not. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, I've been called an activist a lot of the time too, which is a label I never gave myself. You know, I don't see why I'm an activist just because I'm photographing women, but you know, um, please elaborate. <laughs> I don't necessarily feel I'm just photographing my own reality. So I don't know why that has to translate into the idea of activism just for, for the subject matter. I'm more interested in the textures and shapes of, you know, the, the female body. So, and just because of that, and because I'm showing a lot of models that might not be your kind of, what would I say? Like, it's not really featured a lot in the mainstream media. It doesn't mean that I'm taking a political or activist stance saying I have to promote this body type or, or show it and, and, and gain visibility for it. For me, it's purely selfish. Like I, I think my subjects are beautiful and amazing and intriguing and so many things. So I think of the body more as kind of an artist material. I also work with the, the body and, and portraiture and things like this in my own work. And I get grief constantly for basically hiring professional, beautiful, you know, stereotypically beautiful models. And so like, so the fact that you are doing this sort of this other work that addresses it as an issue. And, and I get, as I said, I get grief about it quite frequently. So I'm sort of interested as like, why did you choose to go down that path? Like sort of, I'm sure something brought you to that. I mean, you, I can't imagine mm -hmm. you sort of woke up, uh, you know, fully formed and said, Oh, I need to do this. Right. Yeah. right. So it's so like, what brought you to it? And then sort of like, how is it, how are people reacting to it? Yeah. Which also makes me curious to hear your opinion there I'm on photographing quote unquote, like traditionally beautiful, models as a man do you get grief for that for being a man too all the time yeah, yeah. i am a, i'm a not only a man but i'm a white man mm -hmm. and a, you know probably christian and american like i get all kinds of grief because i am all kinds of white privileged mm -hmm. american man and yeah i've been like i mean for my entire career there's always been sort of that issue of um you know, am I a pervert or whatever, if I'm actually doing this for sort of legitimate purposes, like I feel like 
every time I go out for a photo shoot, I'm always having to like really say like, I'm not a pervert. Mm -hmm. I just want to take pictures of beautiful people doing beautiful things and beautiful clothes and beautiful locations. Like, mm -hmm. That's what I do. And yeah, I get grief about it all the time, even from my own wife. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that I'm not considered a pervert. I mean, I'm doing the same thing, but it, like, I'm not a pervert because I'm shooting bigger women. You know, I think that's bizarre. Yeah, also, but you're but, a woman. Sure, but I'm like a freaking female Terry Richardson. Like, I'm, I'm, I love my models. Like, I, I get all like super excited about my shoots. But um, wait, wait, not really like Terry Richardson. I mean, he. I don't know. I never shot with him, but you know, okay. I get to be creepy. Like, I, I get, I get permission to be creepy because I'm female shooting females, and and I get to be extra creepy because I'm shooting plus size models because they're not fetishized in the same way. So it's. It's, it's a different kind of reality, which is weird. It's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of discussions with the models I photograph and especially the plus size community are also kind of saying how bizarre it is that just because they're appearing naked in a photograph and, you know, they're immediately labeled as activists, they can't just be models. You know, they have to be something more. They can't just be, you know, a person who want to have their photograph taken. Like they're always... So I think there's a lot of unwanted pressure for a lot of them too to, you know, engage in activism that they didn't set out to do. I wouldn't agree with the word activism. I think that's mm. the wrong word. I don't know what the right word would be, but that just when I think of activists, I think of like protesters and things like this. Ah, and I think like body activism or body positivity and that whole movement. So I think that there's a desire to not always be connected with it like i feel like so much of photographing anything that isn't a stereotypically like traditionally quote-unquote beautiful woman ends up being labeled body positive and that's something that i think it's a little problematic too even though it's supposed to have a very positive connotation it's got the word positive in it it does it does <laughs> Maybe we should just have body negative. I don't know. I don't know what that would be. I think that's called bullying. I think that's just called fashion. It is tough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, well, I mean, and that goes to sort of the thing. Like, so you're trying to do commercial work mm -hmm. in, and you're in Los Angeles, correct? Yes. Which is like the iconic city of all sort of facades and beauty and all this, and trying to work with fashion agencies and fashion, you know, clients. And simultaneously working in this sort of, you know, more alternative body positive. I'm not sure what the right word is. I'm mm -hmm. sure I'm putting my foot in my mouth on that. How does that sort of come together or doesn't it stick come together? I feel like the commercial work I've had here, so many times I see my own stuff on their mood boards and they're like, you know, often it is my plus size subjects and they'd be like, okay, we want this, but we want like 5% of it. We want this, but with like a hot model. I was like, okay, great. That's just Did awesome. they actually use the words like hot model? Yeah, I've heard it said before. Yeah. But I mean, that's also, I, I guess I can be a little hard to work with or something. I'm pretty uncompromising in what I feel like I want to put out there. And I think I sabotage a lot of opportunities for myself because of that as well. I work for some modeling agencies before developing portfolios for younger models. And I felt like that was like the peak of my creepiness. I felt like I was not okay with it, um, of sexualizing young women in the way that I did. And I can see, I mean, it's just weird to put someone in that position who's like, what, 16 years old and be like, hey, you're going to pretend you have this whole sexual repertoire in terms of expressions. You know, you're, you're always you know, engaging with the camera, the camera is like, you know, even though I'm a female is kind of the male gaze. So it's, that's who you're talking to. And I wasn't comfortable doing that at all. So it, the, the commercial photography for me came a problematic because of the kind of sexualized content. That said, I enjoy photographing a lot of people who don't feel empowered by their own sexuality and want to discover that through photography. And I feel like that's different because it's for them and the way they might not have seen themselves. So I do work with a lot of private clients who, you know, want to develop a portfolio for themselves, but I'd rather not do it with 16 year old girls flying over from, you know, Ukraine, staying in a crowded apartment here in Los Angeles with another 20 girls, like, you know, sucking on a lollipop in pictures. I can't, I can't do it. 
I think you're being very generous at 16 years old. I would assume they're probably younger than that. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I tried child, not child, I guess you would say child modeling. I mean, when I was 13, 14, when I lived in Sweden, I was signed to an agency and I remember how bizarre I was coming in, having like a candid discussion about the amount of body hair I had, like having to show where I had birthmarks and it was just a way I hadn't related to my body before. So I think I remember how that made me feel. And I was like, I don't think I ever want to make another woman feel that way. It wasn't that it was, I didn't think it was that weird back then, but in retrospect, I was like, Ooh, you know, maybe I should like, you know, actually have sex with someone first before I start like emoting this stuff in pictures. This is really weird. Yes, but th that's not to encourage younger people to have sex. That's just to say, wait till later. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, good. Just clarifying. Just in case somebody's <laughs> why some of us gets triggered here. No, no. Just seriously, it's it's just it was way too soon. All of that, you know. Well, it seems like these days, sexualization and all this is getting younger and younger and younger. I oh mean, yeah, for it, sure. Like I remember, you know back when I was a kid, which is a long time ago, that, you know, you had to like show ID before you could even buy a Playboy or mm -hmm. anything like this. Like, I mean, so the, there was a certain age limitation put on access to things that were overtly sexualized, whereas now, of course, it's, it's completely democratized. At all yeah. times. <laughs> for, for free. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. I don't know what it would be like growing up right now. Like maybe I'm completely like super old and uncool, but I feel like I get more conservative the older I get of seeing these, especially young models. I'm like, no, 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 just <laughs> this time, this time, this time to do all that, you know, just not right now, you know, maybe wait until you're 18 or something. Yeah. Don't look at me. I started doing drugs at 14. So like, who am I to judge? Good for you. You know, yeah. everybody's got to do their thing. Of course, of course. you got to get out of your system for sure. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't get out of my system until I was 30. Oh, yeah. But at least probably no adult gave it to you and was like, here, do this thing. Oh, no. It was kid on kid. Like, yeah. it was peer, peer pressure. Yeah. yeah. It was a girlfriend at the time introduced me to it. Yeah. Yeah. Girlfriend's a bit generous on that. But yeah. Anyways. Female. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I was just I was just trying to think back through it. Like the first time I ever did drugs was when somebody at a party slipped acid in my drink. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. I think that's like how my first drug experience will be. I haven't even done them yet. So I think if that's ever, I mean, I'm not putting out in the universe. It's not what I want. Like I putting out the David Hasselhoff thing, the drug thing, mm -hmm. I'm fine without, but oh, that's terrifying. It was. It, or maybe yeah. amazing. I don't know. Maybe like that's the way to go. Uh, it, uh, yeah, boy. I mean, it was awkward because it was. Boy, I hope my parents don't listen to this. But the um, it was in a weekend. We we had had a party. Uh, Saturday was the wedding of my cousin, and Sunday was going to be the funeral of my grandmother. And so between the parties on Saturday night is when I got slipped my first wow. bit of acid. So, yeah. So I went to my grandmother's funeral tripping on acid. So that was interesting. How was that? Fascinating. We, she sat up out of the coffin. We had a conversation, yeah. you know, yeah. talked with this Native American Indian that was in the cemetery who probably wasn't actually in the cemetery. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. It was, I mean, it was good acid and it was great fun. So yeah. no complaints. A typical experience then. Yeah, I mean, no, very hallucinogenic, like mm. extremely hallucinogenic, which is wow. not as common these days with acid. But uh, again, I haven't done it in a long time. I've been clean for four, 17 years now. Mm. Do things, you move on, do other things. Correct. Photograph beautiful women in beautiful clothing, doing beautiful things. You try to, but, yeah. uh, you know, but even doing that is a really difficult living. Like, yeah. A, you know, a lot of people in photography, A, but also a lot of people in the rest of the world, they glamorize the idea of being like a fashion editorial mm -hmm. beauty photographer. And they think it's like this glamorous lifestyle of just like, sh you know, all the shit that you see in movies and TV and it's bullshit. Right. 
like in, you know 80 85 percent of your time you're running around hustling trying to get new clients or just doing paperwork or doing taxes mm -hmm. or repairing something or whatever that is not glamorous mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> is that still true because i mean i'm going off of my experiences oh no there's nothing glamorous about any of this stuff was was there ever i mean maybe in the 70s with all the Oh, there was a time. Rock and roll, but I, I think I missed all of that being born in the 80s. Well, even back with George Hurl and Irving Penn and all that gang with the movies and all that, there was mm. a certain glamour to it at a certain time, you know? Yeah, we've definitely missed the glamorous photography time. I think maybe like Ellen Wan Arnworth, she might be glamorous, you know? I think her sets she might be. She is. She's a, she's a fabulous. Yeah. I've liked her since Snaps, her first book when it came out. Like, Incredible. She's good. She's great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was seated next to her, or I mean, a table away from her at the IPA Awards last year, and I was like, oh, God, that that's a life right there. That's like a live photo shoot kind of hangout. It, it was amazing. So many beautiful people at the table. It was like transported in time. And she is always beautifully dressed herself as well. Mm -hmm. Like, my God, her wardrobe must be astounding. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, she got it right. But I don't really know that many people, at least photographers, that I feel like have that air about them now where, I don't know. And there's something very spontaneous about the way she shoots too. And I don't think she differentiates so much between a, I could be completely wrong, but like a professional commercial shoot as something that she does candidly. Like she's really present in everything that she does. Like just seeing her taking snapshots of models at a freaking dinner is just as kind of fun and and exciting as anything else she does so she kind of lives and breeds it she does but she was also a model herself so there is that sort of you know knowing both sides of the industry that i'm sure helped her a little bit mm -hmm. true theoretically i don't know i've never met the woman but i would love to again yeah. if she's listening and she, or if you know somebody that uh -huh. knows her i would love to have her as a guest okay <laughs> So we now have two, David Hasselhoff, Ellen Von Unworth. We're good. Okay. Putting it out there. Yeah, fair enough. So on a, another side note, because you said you have multiple names, you also have multiple lives, basically as a sumo wrestler, as a model, it seems at some point, oh. as, a, as a photographer, uh, but you also have a partnership of doing, uh, oh, doing yeah. creative works with your, I think it's called I'm pronouncing it Shadler. Oh, that's pretty good. That would be awesome. I, I've never thought about it that way, but it probably is. SH Sadler is what we go by. Okay. But yeah, for sure. That is a creative partnership I have with a cinematographer called Nick Sadler, who happened to be the first person I ever met in Los Angeles. And he also works as a software designer and it's really comes more from the commercial world. So I think the stuff I do with him might be in terms of visual language, leaning more toward the kind of commercial aspect. But we do very, very different work. My personal work is usually maybe not as intentionally humorous <laughs> as the stuff we do. And he is more into, I, he'll probably slap me for saying that, but I feel like more traditional portraiture maybe. And he thinks I'm all weird and shit. So it's it's a nice it's a nice place to meet up to kind of have like a a creative dialogue that I I wouldn't have otherwise. So he brings a lot to the table from his background and and hopefully he'll get something out of working with me, who knows. Yeah. I'm fascinated by the fact that you're the weird one in the in the duo. Traditionally the man is more the weird one in the world. Oh, is it? More... I mean he's weird uh -huh. in his own ways. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But he's a little bit more technical than I am. That's for sure. He's got a lot more technical knowledge. And uh, I like to sit and edit and do all the post-production stuff and, uh, yeah, tell him to go away. I do this now. So, yeah, no, it's lovely. All right. Yeah. One thing I didn't ask you about, actually, that I like to know about people is uh, how did you become a creative person? So your parents, some schooling, some life experiences, mm -hmm. like what led you down the path to even find photography at all? I grew up with 
My dad would never say he's creative, but he's a sound engineer. I think he's totally super creative. And my mom has dabble in everything from music and acting and painting, God knows what else. And they're running, um, well, I think they're retiring now, but they've been running like a vintage recording studio in Stockholm ever since I was born. And I was always really encouraged to try everything. Minus maybe like heavy drugs, but so I tried, you know, everything from pottery and piano, horse riding, like Kung Fu, you name it, like I I did it all. But I really snowed in on theater. That was kind of my thing. And my mom used to call me the little dictator and a very specific dictator too. I'm just not going to say his name because that's that's an awful one. You can probably figure out who it is because I just loved bossing or bossing over people apparently. So I started doing little place in school and after school like I was directing things and also playing like all the lead roles but I would get people in just to play kind of like extra walk like walk on parts so I would just like change clothes and speak to myself and you know like a real kind of narcissistic (sighs) child like I'm so embarrassed about all that because there's videos of it and I'm not okay with that (laughs) It's like I was I was an awful kid, but I still am to a certain extent. But I think theater was kind of my main thing. And in Sweden, you get to decide when you're 15, like how you do junior high, because 40% of your curriculum is going to be made up of a subject of your choice. And I pick theater. And I realized very early on that I had a problem with authority. And I felt that the acting thing maybe wasn't really in the stars. So just to kind of get me to pass school, some of the teachers suggested like, oh, why don't you direct a play instead? And that kind of became the starting point for me. And I was like, this is amazing. I I should be making films. So I was making a lot of short films and using my time in school that way. And at the end of, this is like a bizarre story, but it's true. I really wanted to go and study in the States, but it was kind of too expensive. And I applied to Centro St. Martin School of Fine Art in London and some other ones there as well, thinking that their fine art program, because it did say film, video and performance, meant that it was just a traditional film school because that's what I wanted to do. So I got in on this BA thing and I was like, came to school and was in complete shock first of all like barely spoke English but like we had to present our work and I was showing like some little you know two minute experimental movie I made and I stood next to this woman who'd apparently blown like 10 different guys and like put you know the semen in little Dixie cups and was like drinking them as a performance and I'm like what the heck is going on like where am I and there was another woman who was deciding that her piece to show was her just like squirting water through her private parts. And in a way, I was like, this is like a freaking freak show. But this is awesome. Like, I can't believe I'm here. I'm so lucky. Like, I had no idea. So fine art just ended up being like the best place for me because it was it just permitted everything. So there was no rules, no nothing. So I kind of I didn't desert the film. I mean, I still made film in fine art school, but my subject matter kind of shifted. Then I became really interested in in performance and, and performativity in, in authentic expression in, in f- fiction movies, I mean, what have you. So I staged a lot of films with like extreme uh, rules and obstructions, always using actors shooting a lot of content where like I would kidnap actors who knew that they were going to be part of some movie I was making, but they would be like abducted from the street and brought to a completely pitch black space where they never met before and performed this like highly sexual kind of play and never see each other. And then, you know, so it was, it was great. It was awesome. So it, I think, you know, I probably would have continued with the film stuff if that had been easier and not, me being dependent on so many people. So photography was kind of, was a way for me to continue staying creative without waiting for permission to do work. I totally get it. Yeah. 
I mean, we're basically creating film stills more or less when we're oh, making yeah. our photographs. Like, hundred yeah. percent, yeah. There's always a story of what happened before and what will happen after, but this it's you're just sort of freezing that one moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So that that's how I probably I would say that's how I approach it now as well, especially in terms of expression. Like I've I've been interested in these very kind of neutral expressions on my models too of. Like, how do I photograph something where somebody is completely devoid of the idea of their own sexuality? Like, how do I find a place where they're not suggesting anything, but kind of simply existing? And I think that's, that's kind of where I'm at with my work right now. And that's what I really enjoy photographing, at least in the context of, of the nudes that I do. Like, that's become a big thing for me that I'm, very interesting in pursuing, like, how do I remove all this kind of sexual idea of this body? I mean, I come from a place where, you know, we're very pragmatic about nudity. So I was surprised moving to the States and also England, you know, how, how sexualized the body is here. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> well, it's very sexualized and you're not supposed to show much of it. Like, seriously. So yeah. Serious. It, it's sort of a bit of a contradiction. Yeah, absolutely. And at the same time, where people are so obsessed with fashion here, that really just tells you where to look at the body too. So it's like, I feel a lot of the time, the more clothes we put on, like the more attention we kind of direct toward it as well and how we want to be seen and and what we want to show off and what we want to hide. So yeah, it's interesting. I think about that a lot when I travel to the Middle East too of how very sexualized the body is there too, you know, with the extreme cover up. I don't know. It's like a, it's interesting. You know, I, sometimes the, the hidden body is a lot more sexualized than, than the naked one. Oh my God. When in the Middle East, the women put so much effort on their face mm. to, to, because it's the only thing they can really express themselves with mm -hmm. that they put, they go so outrageous with their hair and makeup. Well, actually not hair, sorry, yeah. makeup no. um, to, to, because it's their only form of expression. I mean, I live, I was living in Abu Dhabi and I was teaching Muslim women art. Oh. So yeah, I've got to know many of them and they're, you know, the ones I was teaching were not too conservative as a general whole. So they, they actually wore their own clothes and opened up their abayas during the day and things like yeah. that. So like, it wasn't that bad, but, but yeah, their, the, their faces sometimes as much as little as their eyes, their handbags mm -hmm. and their shoes, like oh, those yeah. are of the utmost importance because they're the only things they can show yeah. or the only ways they can express themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. One well, and now their phone covers as well. Oh actually. yeah, I remember last time I was there, I noticed a lot of like beautiful sleeve work too. It's becoming more popular. I yes. think so. Yeah, yeah, that was something I noticed. What were you doing in the Middle East? I love the Middle East. I was riding in last time I was in Jordan, and I went horseback riding there. Incredible. Jordan is very progressive. Very progressive, yeah. yeah. And then I went to Iran two years ago, which was really interesting. Not very progressive, I assume. I've never been there. I would say the younger generation is... is. I mean, it was really interesting because I got to hang out with a lot of university students. I wish I could have hung out more with them, but I was busy just like puking for most of my trip and being, you know, quarantined to my hotel room with severe food poisoning and dehydration. But uh, from uh, the few days I was able to be outdoors and actually have genuine conversations, I do think that there's a very interesting kind of generational gap there, but I wish I would have spent more time you know, to go back. It's still there. You It'll can go back. It'll still be there. I know. <laughs> Can't go anywhere now, though, but soon, hopefully. Yeah. I noticed that you're represented by an agency as a photographer. Now, are you represented as a commercial photographer or a fine art photographer? Ooh. Second part, wait, second part to that question. Do you have a gallery that represents your fine art if that's not the same? Not the same. There is a gentleman, Eric Dover, who is my agent, who I would say like most of the repertoire of his photographers are photographers 
who are fine art photographers who also branch out and do commercial work. So he will get kind of more creative commercial gigs that might be looking for a photographer a little bit more experimental than you know, sort of the usual repertoire. So he does represent fine art artists who work in photography, but also I, I guess photographers who would also call themselves commercial, but might have more of a fine art language. And then that sort of leading to the question. So like, do you do exhibitions of your fine art? Most of the stuff I've done has been in the context of group exhibitions or photography award exhibitions. I haven't had a solo exhibition. Would love to putting out there in the universe. Uh, so mainly it's... No, no, uh, you have to be proactive on that, that people are just not looking to give that way. For solo shows. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand that too. No, so usually, yeah, group stuff. I don't even know where people have the time to like really go out and advocate for themselves while making work and then, you know, making food, picking up their kids. Like, I, I don't even know. Like, I don't know. Well, that's sort of what I'm leading down the path of, of questions here, which is sort of like, so like, how do you make a living doing all this stuff? So like, you're working for, you have a representative for you as an artist, which also, by the way, I wanted to know, how did you get representation? Because keep in mind, I'm obviously older than you. I'm 46. I will be 47 soon, but 46. And uh, the idea of like uh, photographer agents was not really around when I started my career and they've become much more prevalent. Uh, so like, how do you even, how did you, what was your experience of how to get an agent as a photographer? I actually reached out myself because I, I thought what he, the people that he was representing is like kind of where I want to take my own work. And I mean, it was just really lucky that there was a match. I just felt for a long time that this whole advocating for yourself and to suggest and defend your rates and all this stuff is it, difficult, you know, because you end up doing a lot of, you know, favors for your friends. You end up, you know, making deals for people. And I just don't want to be that person doing that stuff in an ideal world, like I could focus on actually making the work, not just the 98% of all the bullshit that goes around, you know, being your own freaking PA, doing this, doing that. Like sometimes I would love to show up to work. That would be amazing. But it, it you know, I understand that this is, a, there's a very lucky few that can do that. And uh, most of them have also been doing that for a long time. And I don't think that they're there because of a photographic rep per se because they might just have been around long enough to have that luxury. But I feel like that's, for me, the logical next step, at least now, because, yeah, I don't, I don't want to deal with <laughs> that stuff. And I, I, you know, I have some working relationships with some publications, etc. but it's, you're kind of low on the totem pole trying to say like, okay, well, when is this thing I've done for you? And when is it coming out? And they'll sit on it for six months. And then suddenly they're like, oh yeah, deciding we're not going to run it because now the makeup that we, you were using in this thing is kind of last year's, you know, whatever. And I'm like, why do I take it now then? Like I've spent all this time waiting for you to publish this thing. And it could be things that they commission. It could be things that you submit, but I feel like if you have, some sort of representation that that process might be maybe a little bit more straightforward and quicker because they're being held accountable. But I feel like there's so, especially publications out there that they'll just sit on your work and, you know, not communicate or you send it in and they start ghosting you. And it's, I think it's just rude, <laughs> but there's, you know, I guess that there's also so many photographers working with these uh, people too, that there's just not enough time for, you know, in the day for them to reach out to everybody either. But it's, I don't, I'm not really sure what the answer is to that. But I, you know. I'm all for it. I love the idea of having somebody represent us as creative people. I mean, traditionally in the fine art world, it was, you know, a gallerist mm -hmm. would be the person who did that. And so the idea that in the commercial photography industry, that there's now people basically that can do that. Because we as creative people did not get into the business of, being creative to do the business. Mm -hmm. We got in it to be creative. Like that's our strength. And so like the idea of being able to, you know, give some money to somebody and they do all the business stuff for you, rock 
on Mm -hmm. all about it. Yes. Yes, please. Also, I'm so disorganized. I don't even know what day it is when I wake up. Like, I think that's the thing for a lot of artists too. Like we, I think a lot of artists have a kind of a different functioning brain too, that it doesn't come that, you know, natural to us to have that sort of analytical mind and have a strategy, you know, like I'm highly emotional and I, a bad mood will like screw up my day. But I think if you're an agent, like that can't be and stand in your way. So I need someone like that. So I can be at, uh, you know, at uh, spacey as I am <laughs> and use it to my advantage. Fair enough. Now, in L.A., I mean, are, do you have a, like a full-time studio? Do you have a place you rent? Because I would imagine rent's not cheap there. No, I share a photographic studio with my partner, Nick Sadler, which is based out of his residence in Hollywood. And then I rent a photo studio, larger ones, when I have things that require more than one model and otherwise I shoot from home and I have a little home studio here. Okay. Yeah. Actually that brings up another question. You brought up rental. Mm-hmm. I have this position that I don't own and I actually at this exact moment, I'm also a photographer, by the way, I didn't know if I ever mentioned that, but I don't own any photo equipment. Uh, I rent it when I need it because the technology just keeps advancing so quickly and the, and the, the they get better and better and better. Mm-hmm. And, and it just, I see no reason to purchase because I don't shoot, I don't shoot very often. So I'm not commercial and all that, but I would imagine even in the commercial industry, like it would be so smart just to rent the equipment and then just basically charge the client for the rent daily rental of the stuff instead of owning. So like, do you own equipment? Oh, a hundred percent. I think if I, and the reason being like, if, if there's a gig that calls for, equipment other than my own which will probably be most commercial things then great then the client can pay for it but in terms of my personal work i mean i i don't see a reason to to be intimidated by how technology progresses as fast as it does because the way we view photography has radically changed as well like i recognize that most of my photography you've seen it on a computer screen at 72 dpi you know with a pixel length of what 1080 maybe so not saying that that is you know that's not how i retouch my work and obviously you know my files are large and good and can be printed really large but most of my work will never be printed on a gigantic billboard requiring like one gigabyte file size from a Fuji GFX camera. Like I worked on it, but, but the fact is like, why would I, why would I choose a format that is so high resolution too, and just clogs up on my hard drives and making it more expensive for me to make work when I can happily do this on my, you know, Canon. We all want to shoot with as high resolution as possible because we're all we all have faith that someday we will be able to print that the way we want it yeah but i i also feel like a lot of the really really high res stuff now is not really all that flattering or or you know when mini dv came onto the market like many years ago with film people were like we can't watch this this looks too real like it hurts my eyes. Like this is not cinematic, you know, and I can feel the same way now sitting there retouching, you know, files from the Fuji GFX, which is an incredible camera and it's so much fun, but it's not for everything. I don't feel like, uh, you know, doing retouching on that is going to give me nicer skin tones or anything else than I would get from something of a third of the resolution. So I think it all depends also of your what, what you're photographing, of course, and, and how you envision your work. But I rarely print anything that's, you know, larger than 45 by 30 inches. Like that's kind of my go-to. I'm AO myself. I like really like large prints. What's that? A0. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I like large, I, you know, so like, I don't even know inches anymore. I've been living in Europe for so long. Um, for, 42 mm-hmm. inches wide, 68 inches tall. Yeah, yeah. That's that's sort of my format that I love so much. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, you're right. There's no reason to shoot bigger than that at the moment. But, 
you know, we all want that. Like even when I was a kid, I used to shoot four by five and and then I didn't print them the scale that was, you know, that four by five was necessary, mm -hmm. but like, but God, the quality, it just looks good when you're working on it though. Yeah. But then something else is going to come out. It's going to be bigger and better. And like, this this constant, like, do I always have to stay with this, you know, or, or am I becoming too obsessed with the, the, pixel ratio or quality or resolution when I instead of focusing on my subject and what is I'm trying to do what story am I telling like does this story require this image to be humongous oh yeah don't get me wrong I shot with a four by five for 15 years until I started to do some commercial work mm -hmm. and it was during when digital had come out and so of course I had to get a digital camera to do the commercial work they wouldn't wait for my four by fives yeah so, okay, so let's get like super techy. So like, what do you shoot with these days? Uh, Canon 5D Mark II, uh, no, no, not Mark II, Mark IV for the mm -hmm. most part, like for most of my fine art stuff, mainly because I'm terrible at learning new things. Like, unless I have a problem, I'm not gonna learn it. So I, st I stick with what I know. I alternate and I go back and forth in between Lightroom and Photoshop. Photoshop being more important to me than Lightroom, but Lightroom is new for me. But I see how it's great to do your initial grading in there before importing it. So it does save me a lot of time now. I would say my post-production, I call it post-production probably because I come from video. I don't know if people even say post-production, but the retouching, all that stuff. But retouching sounds to me it's like it's only cosmetic. For me, I think of the whole image as, as kind of like a film still and I can... I call it post-production. Sort of, Anything yeah. after the shoot is, is to, to me, defined post-production. Yeah. So that, that process for me is a lot longer, usually, than, than the shoot itself. A lot of time I consider the shoot a place for me to sort of collect my artist material, and then I get to paint. So my happy place is really in front of the computer, and I'm pretty, like, layer-heavy. Like, I do a lot of adjustment layers, and, and I sit there with my Wacom tablet drinking coffee, being very happy. Okay, wait, I have a question because I've had this conversation with other photographers. In the old days, film, like you had to go out and you bought your film before you showed up for the shoot mm -hmm. and you only had, you know, however much film you had on hand for your shot. So photographers were a little bit more sort of thoughtful mm -hmm. before they clicked the shutter because they were limited. However, now there's digital and of course you could just take tens of thousands of photos and then go back later and choose the best one yeah. so do you shoot a lot and then try and find a great one or are you a bit more uh, sort of slow and precise with your posing and everything in the shooting process oh i'm super quick i need to be super quick i feel like i feel like the best expressions i get at least from my subjects are ones where we might be having a casual conversation. I'm catching it unaware. I feel like the first five minutes of me doing anything is usually the most interesting shots I get in terms of expression. And I only ever pick, I can, I can always be okay with like a minor little screw up of, of like, Oh yeah, the hair wasn't perfect here, this or that. Like if I get the expression that I want, then the rest doesn't matter. And I know when I get it, like I, I, I know when I have it and then I don't really go and push because I feel like that's, that's not necessary. I like the kind of immediacy of it. So it doesn't say that I don't shoot a lot of frames, but I don't think, I think the longer I've been doing this, the less I shoot. So I probably average maybe between 250, 300 shots per shoot, which is still is a lot. You know, if you think about film, <laughs> it's still a lot. Yeah, I don't tether or anything like that either. I always feel like models love to like look at themselves and wonder what's going on. Like I, I want to have that interaction just between me and my subject and make it feel quite intimate and relaxed. And then I usually go through just on my camera. And if I see what I want to see, then I'm like... I hate showing the models when we're when oh, I'm shooting I refuse. because they get super self-conscious mm -hmm. and they get more concerned and all, all these things that you don't want from a model. You want them to be relaxed and casual. And, and I, I hate it when they ask to look at the photos. I was just like, yeah, here they go. And just like flip through them really fast. So they can't even see them. 
it doesn't really work in your favor most of the time. And I think maybe if you're working with a you know, professional model who's been doing this forever, it's one thing, but most of my subjects are not professional. So they are often very highly critical of themselves or they, you know, it's like I, when I was working in film too and doing ed, film editing, like you, a lot of the producers, and whoever would come in into the editing bay would like not understand the process. So for you to tell them like, oh yeah, this, this thing will have a sound effect here and this, th they don't get it. They're like, why is there no sound there? And I'm like, yeah, because it's not put in yet. It's, it's a whole composition. It's a whole, it's a larger vision than this. This is, this is a raw file. And I mean, some people shoot with the intention of like, this is the photograph I'm taking, but my process is not like that. So my process, you know, I, I might take a photo that get, takes me 10 minutes to photograph, but I might sit with it for two days. So the vision is just very different. It is interesting how people seem to want to be more involved in the photographic process. Like I come mm. from the school of thought of like, I'm the creative person, I'm the artist, but let's say, and I, I, so I'll take my picture, I'll go back, I'll sit in the dark room or Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever, and I'll, I do all the work, and then I will present you with the finished work. Mm -hmm. You, Nobody else needs to be involved in that. That's my process. Yeah, and but I mean, people they, like, they do. They want to see, they do, they're, they're very nosy. But do you think maybe that has to do with also social media a lot, that people are so now used to thinking of themselves as a brand or an image, like they have a very specific way they want to be portrayed and they're used to taking a lot of selfies too. Like they have a certain angle they want to replicate. And I really want to get away from all of that because I think it's really crippling. The idea for me, I, I find it utterly fascinating that when people want to take my picture and I take great delight in seeing how, what like a monster I can look like by someone who photographs me and how great I can look from some other people. Like, it's just, it's fascinating how someone can view you. And if you're open to maybe taking that risk of saying, okay, well, I've taken like 50,000 selfies. Now I'm actually just going to let go and have this person photograph me in a different way. So I might see something new about myself. It's also kind of quite exciting. So but I, I would imagine that it has a lot to do with with that and how people want to be involved now too. And people are very protective of their image. Like that's, that's uh, I, I find it kind of bizarre too. Like I, this whole selfie culture and Instagramming that wasn't, I mean, this is so new too, you know, that I, I don't know. Also know like who is the audience for all this work, for all these selfies, you know, they all look the same. Like who, when do you decide like this is this is a good picture of me when they all look the same like do you go back selfies like three years ago on your instagram feed and you're like this one's not so good anymore like where what what is a good selfie like this is something i also it's a project i would love to do at some point i'm very fascinated in people's idea of how they look and also how i think they look i'm sure some algorithm exists that would be able to explain to you how people like to project themselves in selfies oh yeah i mean you can see how that's kind of changing too and absolutely i mean there's people now going and have surgery to look like their own selfies you know because your camera distorts you know facial features so much that you know for you to replicate that look and look like your own instagram self you need some surgical help I remember when those cameras first got created on the phone and I was, and I kept I remember telling all my students, I'm like, it is the most unflattering camera to do a selfie yes. with because it's a super wide angle lens with very low, well, low control, little, very little control over it. But, but it's that super wide angle lens. It distorts and makes your nose bigger and your forehead squish back. Mm -hmm. Like it's a horrible camera lens, particularly to take a selfie with. Yeah. And I see so many young people now just having so much, you know, surgical stuff done to them. And I, I think about, you know, when you had this, you are in LA, I am in LA, but you know, I see it a lot everywhere else. I saw a lot of it in Iran, by the way, a lot, but it's like a status thing there. It means you have money. And a man will like, you know, walk around with a taped nose sometimes to show that they have the money to pay for surgery for their lady. <laughs> so <laughs> utterly bizarre. But I mean, now seeing so many people having all these things done to them, I, I keep thinking about, you know, when 
this kind of Pamela Anderson look was a thing, you know, that kind of surgery in the 90s. And we see those women having grown up now, like being, I don't know, how old would they be now? Don't ask. My, my math is completely off, but, you know. They would, they would be in their early 50s. Early 50s, right? And it's almost like a, quote unquote, a bit of a dated look. Like it's a very specific look. And I keep thinking about those women now who might be like 18, 18 to 22 years old. Like, how are they going to look in 30 years from now? Are they all going to look the same, but like they're going to be like Instagram of whatever year, you know? Like, how is that any different? Yeah. The one I keep noticing is, is the desire for the large butt. Mm. This is a very popular thing right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're not fat they're just large mm -hmm. shapely and i just keep thinking like all you have to do is get pregnant you'll yeah. get that like like i mean i'm just imagining those young ladies in 10 years when they do then have children that they're going to be much larger than that mm -hmm. and they're not going to be happy with that at all like i mean i feel like there's so much bad body dysmorphic issues like and then of course there are these weird trends that are like encouraging people to look like certain things mm -hmm. and i mean they've always existed this is nothing new but they're just much faster and they're more more prevalent they're like when i was a kid once a month a magazine would come that would give you some impression of of like what the the standards of beauty are in the world but now it's literally like every couple seconds you see another image that gives you another standard of beauty and then there's another youtube video out or whatever that's it's, it's inundating their little brains with too much yeah yeah I, I wouldn't know if I had kids now what I would tell them, you know. I was going to say, wait, I want to make sure the little brain was about children, not that women have little brains. I just want to be clear. Oh, on little brain. I just usually think that's like a male genital, but okay. All right. There is that as well. Yeah. I'm perfect. Yes, we have the, the big brain and the little brain. I understand. But yeah, I, I did not in any way mean that against women. That was about small children, their brains being smaller. Yeah, so just sure. be clear. Those are noted. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in mind, this goes worldwide. I want to, you know, I just want to make sure I don't cause some problem. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, anyways, the work that that I first became aware of you from was your work with S. H. Adler, in which you did the faces in the cellophane wrapping and all this kind of stuff. So, like, what brought that work on? What was that all meant to be about? The fresh meat shoot we did was I was feeling very tired of the way beauty was being portrayed in mainstream media. And I thought of like, how far do we go to like preserve this idea of, of not just beauty, but self image and what are we prepared to do for it? And I was thinking a lot about, you know, this whole Instagram culture too, of, you know, you're going out having surgery to basically look like your avatar. It's completely absurd. And I mean, if if these extreme things or, uh, or inventions were out in the market, like would people gravitate toward them and actually utilize them? People are using so many face filters now. So basically you are treating yourself kind of like a piece of meat. So those were the discussions that we had. And we were like, oh, this might be kind of fun if we actually literally make you know, meat faces that are prepackaged. So it was a tongue in cheek thing. It wasn't, you know, I think I appreciate that it got the exposure it did. For me, it was just feeling kind of, you know, disgusted by what was out there and wanting to do something about it. But, but other than that, it wasn't like we sat down for a long time. It was like, let's tell this story, you know, but it, but the Instagram culture, however, really, it really resonated with them and they started really kind of sharing this. So it, it went, I guess, viral is what you say. It is. Yes. Much more than I ever thought possible. And I thought it was interesting that this thing out of all the things we've done, which was kind of a kind of a rather quick project was the one that got all this attention. And it was rejected by the magazines that, commissioned it so we were very happy that it at least got out there <laughs> and got a little bit of recognition 
Okay, a little side note with that, actually. Also, you do work a lot, a lot of work with nudity. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what's your feelings about the, um, uh, what do they call it, community standards that make it Ooh, so that you can't okay. show certain body <laughs> parts? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, it's just observe what we can look at. I mean, you can, you're allowed to show a freaking ravished corpse on Instagram, but if you're showing a nipple, like God forbid. And I think it's extremely toxic because everything else, right? That if you want to find hardcore, you know, porn, you can find on the same device you're browsing Instagram on. Like there's nothing to me that says like Instagram or Facebook or all this stuff should be different then. Like you're not, you can still just Google something and you see it. So how is it any different than you going out or you way on Instagram to find something? And I, I understand there's a thing, you know, where maybe hardcore porn doesn't have a place maybe on Instagram Twitter. or Twitter. Yeah, yeah Twitter. Yeah. No, they, yeah, they, they can do they it. Can do they Twitter. can do it. Yeah. But I mean, on Instagram, I get it. But, but the idea of censoring something, censoring art to me is completely absurd especially since if you look at the beginning of time and the way we portray things and you go to church and people are naked in the ceiling i mean come on come on <laughs> i saw just the other day on um instagram drawings of vaginas that was perfectly it's like full spread eagle drawings of vaginas perfectly legal legitimate appropriate because it was a drawing mm -hmm. not a photograph mm -hmm. that i mean like the uh, first of all i have a problem with the whole fact that they say community standards mm -hmm. which it's not my community no. i don't know where they get these standards because that's not the way no. i would want it but but the fact that you could do a drawing a painting an illustration a sculpture and be as nude and as blunt and forthcoming as you want but if it's a photograph of a real person nude that breaks their standards mm -hmm. like wh wh what are these standards that allow for certain mediums and not others absolutely i wonder that too and i mean it, it i think they have some sort of image recognition software whatever they use to even detect let's say nipples or whatever like i feel it's so absurd that i can not blur out, but pixelate a nipple and basically saying like, look, there's a nipple here. Like, that's what I feel like I'm doing. Like I'm really drawing attention to it. And it's hard because Instagram is a, a really good platform for me to show my work and engage with my audience and kind of finding out who they are. But at the same time, I can never really show my work the way I want to present it. So it's difficult because right now I'm d doing a series that is very like, let's just say it's a, just naked people and it's it looks like a kind of medical textbook kind of naked it's nothing staged it's just like here's a naked body and i'm struggling to find platforms for this like i really want to show this work and i also feel like it's important work for especially younger women and there's a lot of younger women following me on instagram so there's something i like to share but there's no platform format so so me actually doing ironically, a body positive project <laughs> that I actually call body positive cannot come across as body positive because I have to black out everything that I'm trying to show to say that this is normal. And I'm basically saying, well, it's normal, but I can't show it. So where do I put it? I don't know. Like I'm trying to find out like where can I present this work and still connect with an audience that isn't through social media for a project like this but it's also a very kind of social media specific thing where that's where i want it to exist that's where i think it would do most good so it's it's completely bizarre i i, I don't have a answer i think it's absolutely ridiculous <laughs> oh i do as well i'm on your side i don't understand and at the same time i i have forgotten to censor some photographs on my feed of plus size women and for some reason they don't care but if it's you know a smaller size body that can be viewed as sexualized by you know their standards then that's a problem
plus size women can be and are as sexual. Yeah, but they, as, yeah, the okay. Instagram doesn't think so, apparently. Agreed, they do not. Yes, I know. Um, All right, so let, let's last question for you. You you t- do a lot of work about sort of this posi- uh, body positivity and sort of uh, you know all um, other ways of addressing media and beauty and all this kind of stuff. What could a s- potential solution to these problems be? Oh, personally, I wouldn't call it a solution, but I like to just see more of a pragmatic view of nudity when it comes to art and any sort of mainstream media. I do feel that. It's, I don't know if like specifically addressing the fact what we're doing all the time is also that great. Like, I feel like it should just be a commonplace rather than pointing it out. Like, look, here's this brave woman taking off her clothes. I'm like, don't do that. Like, just, it's just a body. Like if we, if we can just get to this, you know, point of realizing it's a vessel that can be done meant for a lot of other things as well. You know, it's something we all have like a flesh suit, you know. It, it it's pretty extraordinary in so many other ways. And there's so many other ways we can celebrate it rather than whether it has sexual currency or not, if we deem it has. So, so I can't tell you what I think the solution is more than we just being, we allowing to see this content. Like I think removing of community guidelines is a good start of actually being able to view art the way it's supposed to be. And, and I really appreciate like the response I've had, especially from, the plus size community of women of feeling that they they do feel some visibility now in my subjects of saying okay i I've, it's nice because i have a body like that and i usually only get to see it in the context of of somebody addressing it as you know this is a you know a fat body or it's it's a, a different body or or you know drawing so much attention to what it is and why it's being shown it's not just being shown because it's being shown so at least for myself, I try and just show different bodies. And I just personally think aesthetically, I just love photographing larger women. So I'll keep on doing that for a while. <laughs> so. Fair enough. I mean, where where do you think this comes from? Because like, you got to understand, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and my father's a priest, a reverend, whatever word you want to put to it. Uh, so like, is this... Do, is this political? Is this religious? Like, where does this even come from? Because I've lived in the United States, the Middle East, and Europe, and so like, the, there are very different cultural perceptions and ways to address the 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 any form, just the human mm-hmm. form. So, why is it that in certain places it's shamed and hidden? Uh, regardless of its size or anything like that and whereas others it's very open and free and sort of not even an issue Mm. well i i can only speak from where i come from it is just i mean even when i went to high school we had co-ed showers like men and women and this was in sweden this was in sweden yes so for me i i was just shocked when i you know, moved abroad. And I was like, wow, it's not like that over here. And I realized me being very physical with people, which I've always grown up being very, you know, huggy, touchy feeling was translated into advances or made people very uncomfortable. And I, I felt I had to start censoring myself. So definitely that was a big cultural shift for me. Of like, okay, wow, I'm being translated. This is being translated in a very different way than I intended to be. Like, I'm just being friendly, but I guess I'm being very creepy now <laughs> or making people uncomfortable, which I don't want to be. Or, or maybe you do. Or maybe I do, kind of, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, I can at least, I mean, I, I really appreciate that I had that upbringing where I didn't have any sort of, also no sexual shame. I mean, maybe it would have been more exciting to be like completely sexually repressed. I don't know, but there's something to be said about that too, I think. But, you know, in terms of equality and all those things, like you, you, you also got to be exposed to bodies and see them and see what they look like. So they don't hold that much charge. And, you know, it, it goes for men and women, you know, when you, when you are not being able to see anything, your mind will make up sh- even crazier shit. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so just being able to to see people of all ages and shapes and everything that like we can't just say like okay well only the only like really hot skinny chicks get to be nude like we can't do that we we gotta we gotta show a broader range of things and that's why i appreciate hot skinny guys yes. also okay, by the way. Sorry. Just yes sorry gender. i just gotta speak from my own experience <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, my, no, I mean, I did some time. I uh, I did a workshop with Jock Sturges mm. uh, at his Montalive at the his naturalist community, and I had to go and participate in the naturalist yeah. community um, by being a naturalist myself while doing the workshop, and it was amazing. Yeah. The people I met at that naturalist community were shocking to me at the time because I mean they. I had never experienced something like that before, but I tell you, I spent seven days at a naturalist community and I would absolutely take my children oh, yeah. to a naturalist community on a regular basis because there is something amazing about it because people of all shapes and sizes and ages and physiques and all this kind of stuff, just, they, it's just, they just live mm -hmm. and they don't seem to judge. They, they're not critical in the ways that the majority of the people in the world are and it was really um eye-opening i me. mean i feel like a shooting nude nudes in general is so gratifying for me too because i always get to hear a story i wouldn't hear from you know a fashion model you know or whatever else like i i get to hear stories and and and, and people carry around like so much of a of a story or sometimes it's anything from shame and pain but joy like there's so much going on and having those conversations with my models it, i mean it just comes out by them being nude in front of a camera because suddenly like they have all this attention they're not just nude by themselves in this private place but they have a spectator uh, so then you know I, I get to hear a lot because they have to go through a lot and go through you know like oh my god i don't know how to handle myself i don't know how my body looks or and hearing also other women's insecurities makes me feel more human and more okay with myself and also less hard on myself. Because I look at all these women I shoot and I find them so beautiful. It doesn't matter who I put in front of the camera. I put them in front of the camera because, not because of their body, but because something captivated me about their face, their look or what they're giving me. And so the body is the last thing I actually look at. It just happens to be there. And I know this sounds maybe counterintuitive since my work is very body centric but i'm very just obsessed with the expression it this person's face has and how that reflects in their body or how they carry themselves so now i'm i'm so incredibly grateful for those dialogues that i get to have with my models it's it's just and i wish i could tell them all the same stuff i would tell if i had a young daughter you know like go out be beautiful be bold have fun with it, you know, don't listen to anyone else because no one can tell you how, how you should be happy and how you should look in order to have the permission to be happy, you know, and then soon, you know, you'll be old and we'll be dead, you know, enjoy it. All right. Thank you very much for taking the time <laughs> to talk course. to me. You too, by the way, enjoy it. Not just, I mean, you're a man, but I'll tell you the same.